Good evening and welcome. My name is Madeline De Delfa and I am the Assistant Director, Programs and Community Engagement at the Rose Art Museum at Brandeis University. Before we begin, I want to take a moment to acknowledge our land statement, which I hope everyone has a chance to read and take in. Thank you. I'm so grateful to all of you for joining this virtual tour of Argavan Kosra V Black Rain. It is my distinct pleasure to introduce Dr. Ganit Ankori, the Henry and Lois Foster Director and Chief Curator of the Rose Art Museum and Professor of Fine Arts and Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies at Brandeis University. Ganit is a scholar, author, educator, and curator who has done remarkable work in the field of modern and contemporary art viewed from a global perspective with emphasis on issues pertaining to gender, identity, religion, trauma, exile, hybridity, disability, and their manifestations in the creative arts. She is internationally renowned for her groundbreaking scholarship on Frida Kahlo and on art from the Middle East. For the past two years, she has worked closely with her former student and Brandeis alumna, Argavan Kosravi, on this powerful exhibition of luminous work which will be on view at the Rose through October 22nd. Please join me in welcoming Ganit Ankori. Thank you, Maddie. Thank you, Maddie. Thank you, Menon, uh, who is uh, working uh, on the technology. Thank you all for joining us this evening. Um, and most of all, thank you to the artist, uh, Agaban Koslavi, who, created a body of work that is not only luminous, as Maddie said, but also of vital importance. Uh, she began uh, working on this show uh, several years ago, but was um, before the brutal murder of Masa Amini and uh, continued uh, over the last year uh, with her be uh, work becoming almost uh, a memorial for uh, Masa Amini and the courageous uh, um, protesters in Iran. So I'm delighted to take you on this uh, virtual tour of the exhibition, uh, Argavan Kosavi Black Rain, on view uh, at the Rose uh, until October 22nd. I emphasize this because if you have a chance to come and see it in person, please do. It provides an immersive spatial experience that even the beautiful professional photographs that I will share today, uh, taken by Julia Featheringill, Featheringill uh, cannot fully convey. Uh, so, Black Rain is the Iranian artist's first comprehensive museum survey, and it has been truly a pleasure and a privilege uh, to present uh, Kosavi's magnificent trajectory from her student days when she doodled on the pages of her Iranian passport through her bold experimentations with multi-paneled reliefs to her monumental freestanding and suspended sculptures produced especially for this exhibition. So here is uh, here are two additional views of the exhibition, uh, which I'll try to, to, to highlight so that you can see that when you enter this space, um, it is distinct from the, um, white cube of a uh, um, European or a US gallery. It is uh, an immersive experience and you kind of enter Kosavi's world. So the title of the show derives from this stunning work that is part of the Rose Art Museum's permanent collection, a generous gift uh, facilitated by board member Adam Green uh, and a gift by Dr. Joseph Wynn and Tammy Tong. Black Rain includes, as you can see, two fragments uh, of two female figures that are partially seen and partially obstructed. Um, a bronze fragment um, depicting the head of a Greek king that you can see here in this illustration. Um, 
seems to try to impose itself on the woman's head. Um, the artist herself says he seems to, quote, overpower her senses and her thoughts. Yet the king's head is broken and metamorphoses into black rain, uh, black raindrops, which the artist also links with Iran's famous, most famous commodity, oil. So the king of bygone times and the power that oil bestows upon the Iranian regime uh, become symbols of repression of women. The artist says, a re repressive patriarchies that have always subjugated women. In contrast, the artist paints emblems of resistance and freedom, the key-shaped earring, an unlocked shackle, um, and another female figure beyond right here who um, reads, immerses herself in a book. And books, whether read or written, as we shall see, recur throughout uh, Kosavi's oeuvre, reflecting women's insatiable quest for knowledge, creative expression, and liberation. So let's start at the beginning. Agavan was born in 1984, just five years after the Islamic Revolution established a theocracy in her homeland, Iran. She spent the first three decades of her life in her native land and recently recalled that these formative years uh, etched a deep psychic schism within her, which remains to this day. She says, my art reflects the double life I led in Iran, adhering to Islamic law in public while holding on to freedom of thought and action in private. Upon graduating with an MFA from Tehran University, Kosavi worked as a graphic designer and children's book illustrator in Tehran. In 2015, she left Iran to pursue life, a new life in the US. As soon as she arrived, she enrolled in the post bac program in studio arts here at Brandeis University. She went on to earn an MFA in painting from the Rhode Island School of Design, graduating in 2018. So I chose to begin uh, this exhibition with Argavan's student work, which reveals the seeds from which her recent work developed. And I must add on a personal note, I met Argavan in 2015 when she just landed at Brandeis have been working with her and following her stellar progression from student to brilliant artist and collaborator with immense pride and joy. So curating this exhibition has been uh, an incredible honor for me, but also this show is something of a homecoming. Um, the, this is the first work she did as an artist. She moved from graphic designer to artist, and this is the work she did as a student at Brandeis. Um, you can see that the geometric shapes and the calligraphy are derived from uh, Persian art, from Iranian, from Islamic art. But already in this early work, you see that she is kind of uh, trying to challenge or break the symmetry and also include, she calls it geometry of a woman, she includes female body parts that were uh, taboo in uh, Iran. This work uh, from uh, her time at RISD, it was an exercise in just learning how to uh, uh, print with laser on plexiglass. What she did, she took her Iranian passport and doodled on it, painted on it, some of these uh, free associations. Uh, she talks about the female body as something that was uh, not, she wasn't allowed to uh, paint or to represent in Iran. That's why she felt the freedom to do so here. But uh, later she, stopped showing the naked female body uh, because she did not want to sexualize or objectify women. 
So being aware of uh, how women are viewed in Western culture, where they are shown, their body is shown, and sometimes exploited. Um, so the work you see moves from uh, two-dimensional to three-dimensional, and this very, very important work, Parallel Lives, um, um, is something that um, refers to parallel lives uh, that one lives as an immigrant, the in-between spaces of living, um, the experience of non-belonging and occupying uh, a space between languages and cultures and states of being. Uh, the pivot, this really pivotal uh, um, work encapsulates several breakthroughs within the artist's practice. And I think it all occurred in her final year as a student. Um, first uh, of all, there are multiple portrayals of a woman, seems to be the same woman, who um, Agamon says is me and women like me. So a kind of uh, alter ego, if you will. The women are uh, encounter various obstructions, whether it's this overpowering male figure on top or blocked doorways or the edge of the uh, plane. The other thing that begins here very prominently is it becomes extremely important in the artist's work is the emphasized um, um, influence of Persian miniatures that you can see with these decorative elements that uh, conjure up architecture and pools and the gardens, the colors. Finally, these are books that the artist uh, uh, shows, again, featuring this most important motif that relates to the to knowledge and creativity. And this work uh, uh, that Argavan, right after she, she graduated a few years later, be, due to COVID uh, and the imposed lockdown, she ran out of art supplies. And, you know, she says to me, I couldn't not paint. So she had a book uh, and uh, she painted on this book. And then she made this book part of this composition, Morning Light. She added this uh, book. So you have a book for reading and you have a book for writing. And uh, there is a small pencil that hangs down. Also, you see the earbuds in uh, the woman's uh, ears. So she is always listening to music. And this idea of uh, women who read, write, consume culture and create culture is very, very important uh, in all this work. So we move from, uh, in the show, from the early works that are flat um, to the later works that become more three-dimensional um, and here we have two works, The Enclosed Garden, which is uh, the first time that uh, the artist actually used uh, a real life element, incorporating it within the art, within the artwork. Also uh, kind of um, creating a shared space for the viewer and the artwork. Um, this three-dimensional work, The Enclosed Garden, uh, uh, illustrates what Argavon says that she likes to take simple metaphors and symbols and complicate them. So the woman who is fragmented, who whose mouth is not closed, but someone tries to control how she opens her mouth. In the background, the garden, which in uh, Persian and Iranian lore is uh, paradise, peace, beauty, 
and the bird freedom is behind her, but the bird that is on this sill is the three dimensional bird um, exits captivity only to find herself dead. So these contradictions, um, the uh, repression of women, the desire for freedom, and uh, the, the battle between those two is something that we see in this work. We also see in Patiently Waiting, and I, uh, this is the same work from two photographed from two different angles so that you see the three-dimensional elements. So she started as a painter and parts of this are acrylic on canvas, but then you have plexiglass, you have cement paint, and you have a woman who is actually two figures or three figures, this uh, multifaceted self. And again, you have the contradiction between the beauty of the paradisal garden and this bomb that's about to explode. And as you walk from these two works that face each other and relate to each other, we move to this corner uh, where we see a hanging sculpture uh, called Sunrise and the orange curtain, which we will discuss now. The orange curtain, also a three-dimensional work, um, talks about this uh, inner schism that um, Argavan uh, felt as she was growing up and as a young woman in Iran. Outside, she had to adhere to Islamic rule, the Islamic regime and their rules. And here you see her being attacked by these um, Persian soldiers. Um, that are copied from Persian miniature manuscripts. Inside, behind the curtain, she felt free, uh, freedom of thought, freedom of action. And um, one of the things that she told me that was very interesting to me that she was surprised when she came to the United States that um, people kept their curtains open at night so she could look into houses, something that was unheard of in Iran because you always closed your window, your curtains. You did not want anyone to see what was happening indoors. Now, behind the curtain, uh, the figure is holding a book and trying to read despite being attacked by emblems of patriarchy. Within, the home, ironically, what you see is a uh, blue sky, freedom, air to breathe, a bird. Yet the um, there is no uh, there are no facial expressions, the tension, the anxiety, the feeling of repression uh, does not show on these women's faces that are covered or partially covered. It is shown uh, through this re um, recreation of the head of Proserpina, a uh, Baroque sculpture that is attributed to Gian Lorenzo Bernini. Proserpina was uh, kidnapped, taken away from her mother and uh, by Pluto, the Roman god of the underworld. And this uh, uh, woman who was uh, kidnapped and, and raped and forced to be his wife um, is very expressive. And you see her mouth uh, open with the screen and the tears in her eyes. So by copying this um, image from another culture, um, Kosavi, uh, kind of expresses something of the emotion that uh, these women feel. Um, you see a three-dimensional work. You see 
Persian miniatures, you see uh, Baroque sculpture, European sculpture, and you see these uh, brightly colored um, uh, geometric abstract elements showing how she um, takes from many cultures and many different uh, forms of expression and somehow makes it into a cohesive work of art. As we move from the orange curtain through the hanging sculpture, um, we see this uh, uh, beautiful work. And I want to, again, express how the works move from being smaller in scale and two-dimensional to reliefs, to freestanding or hanging sculptures. And uh, although some of the themes uh, remain consistent, uh, women and their um, journey uh, being oppressed, by be but resisting such oppression and seeking liberation. The Battleground, beautiful work uh, with feathers and strings, again, totally three-dimensional, is uh, influenced like many of Kosavi's work by the Persian miniatures. This is a, a specific work that is hanging in the rows. We have four beautiful uh, miniatures from the Harvard Museums on loan and two uh, stunning ones from the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. And they side by side, they show um, Kosavi's uh, sources of influence. So this partial view of a large woman is tied. Uh, some of her, uh, her wrists are tied and attached to these soldiers who are, again, these uh, uh, agents of the Iranian regime. Other source of influence, we see the architecture, the beautiful architecture of, uh, that we see within um, some of the Persian miniatures that Argavan uh, loves to emulate and expand upon. Uh, and sometimes undermine. But whereas in many or most of the Persian miniatures, the women are uh, not the main characters, in her work, women become uh, very, very uh, fast. And today they're the, the only character and the same women who are her alter egos. So we see the tower, we see the geometric elements, and we see the beauty of the details uh, that you see everywhere here. There are little um, details like the doves that are in the cages, the uh, garden that is behind with the pomegranates that are signed of, of um, of beauty and uh, one, uh, one dove succeeds in flying off. Um, the uh, woman here uh, holds a pose like the thinker. Um, and uh, we see that this idea of uh, the um, elements like the soldiers trying to uh, confine or contain the woman um, re are repeated in this, the black box. Again, you see the hybrid nature of the, of an immigrant's uh, art. That is, uh, she takes her own culture, Persian culture, uh, within this kind of triptych. These are fragments from hands from uh, classical sculptures, from men's, uh, like, uh, uh, male figures that are trying to reach her. Um, the cube looks like a modernist uh, geometric sculpture. And these are all three-dimensional elements, yet she remains defiant. Um, this resistance is something that is consistent in uh, the work. And then we move from resistance to, to something that's beyond resistance. Um, 
as we'll see, the women begin to uh, carry the emblems of the soldiers that had tried to confront them. Uh, but I want to look at this at her fingertips. Again, you see the very clear um, Persian uh, architecture, the garden. If you look at this uh, work where you have behind a fence, the cypress tree uh, with the intertwined blossoms, she has that here too. And then related to the black rain that we spoke about as we opened this uh, virtual tour, you see a black river and a black pool. And the source for this is in illuminated manuscripts, um, some of which are, as I said, on display, um, silver was used to uh, depict the water. When the silver oxidized, it became black. And this black rain or black water or oil is something that recurs in Argavan's work. Here we see a detail of the work. And I want to call your attention to the luminous fingertips. And these are actually gold strings that contrast with the um, oppressive black strings and contrast with this um, obstruction of the women's vision or identity. What you see is this battle. You see it here too, between the flowering plant and the barred wires. Um, Kosavi uh, sees and, and, and uh, reflects the repression but, and the harsh realities, but also imagines a, a world of creativity and these luminous fingertips and the glowing gold strings like rays of light or something like halos um, that um, she uses uh, and, um, and she uh, depicts. Sorry, something popped up in my, on my screen. So I was distracted. Um, here are, here is another scene from the show. Uh, we use this uh, different uh, color for the wall that has the loans from the MFA and the Harvard Museums. And we have the quote by the artist, my work draws from traditional Persian miniatures. And we see that it does, although she both uh, emulates the miniatures, but also undermines them and subverts some of their meaning. Here is a scene, here is a, a installation shot where you see the proximity between works that inspire each other. Um, this is The Void from 2022, beautiful three-dimensional work. You may recognize this classical uh, head of a woman that's bound up a tree that is in flames firing, a woman that is pushed and seems to be uh, falling down, and this head of uh, the head uh, from uh, Persephone that we saw by Bernini. The um, the work that we we see is. Um, based on um, based on uh, this specific Persian miniature, you see the uh, architecture where you have the top floor uh, with the woman on top and and um, here you have the flames which she loves to uh, emulate but um, here she combines the architectural forms, the um, the the floral motifs, stylized flames, um, and these are from uh, specific 
uh, manuscripts, uh, which um, is taught, which are taught in school, the Shanama, the Iranian Book of Kings, composed by the Persian poet Firdausi, uh, roughly between 977 and 1010. Uh, now, um, The artist envisions a journey that leads uh, the woman from being stuck here through her moving uh, from on horseback through fire. And this is based on um, a well-known Iranian hero, Prince Siavush, uh, who was falsely accused of sexual misconduct and other misdeeds and crimes, but was proven innocent when he went through this uh, being tested by fire. Uh, it's not surprising that the woman is also, as women in Iran, are always accused of sexual misconduct, but you can see that she too is innocent. Um, I, I want you to see the detail that we have. The iteration of the woman on top is that she moves up and her journey leads her to a quiet room of her own, if you will, where she can read the book and look out into the garden uh, and uh, leave the flames behind her. In um, other works uh, from this section, uh, which I call disorientalizing the Odalisque, uh, you know that the reclining nude uh, is quite a ubiquitous motif that has dominated European art for centuries. And since the 19th century, Orientalist painters have depicted reclining women as odalisques set within an imaginary orient. So uh, usually male painters from Europe were thinking about uh, imagined an orient of the senses and imagined uh, uh, women uh, lying down uh, for them. Now, Kosa V uh, paints women lying down. Here you see these three works, all from this last year. But the women are not neither exposed nor exoticized, and they occupy an oriental space for sure, as you can see here from uh, the 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 her kind of inspiration from the uh, Persian miniatures, but they seem to be looking inward, they're self-possessed, uh, or they look out, but they're not there for the viewing pleasure of the male gaze. So she perceives her uh, reclining women as dwelling in a space of dreams, a place where they can activate their subconscious um, um, subconsciousness and imagination. She identifies with this need to turn inwards and not to uh, uh, look out um, and, and be looked at and perceived by others, uh, specifically by men. Um, and sometimes uh, the women are uh, pursued as in this one in the flight um, you see uh, the soldiers. Um, and this uh, work, uh, which hangs directly uh, across from uh, the Persian miniature, they share these red flags and some of the same figures um, together. Um, and um, the white flag, this uh, uh, fantastic uh, large scale work, again, shows the woman with her eyes closed, her mouth sewn closed, uh, uh, this uh, weight uh, ball and chain trying to weigh her down, but she holds the key. And even though the, um, the tree is burning, she, there is a woman in the window reading a book. 
So this tension between the attempt to fragment and repress the women and their perseverance moves forward in 2023. And I think this really has to do with the inspiration of the woman life freedom movement in Iran. The women move to become soldiers like in this one, the warrior. And the way that uh, um, she does it is by actually um, creating the helmets and the mail chain and the feathers, all of them uh, in veristic uh, manner. And she also makes them into a weapon here, a uh, missile. Um, in this work, the scissors, the hair that becomes a symbol of liberation, um, she shows the women who are protesting uh, in, um, embraced or protected by this uh, four, arm, four mirror armor that is uh, uh, what, uh, what is seen in Persian miniatures. This is uh, Persian armor from uh, various places that she actually depicts. And again, you have to come to the museum to see this. This is three dimensional. Uh, the hand is, is from within. The hair becomes um, the, the foundation upon which the women's uh, protest is, uh, stands. And uh, in the bird and our hair is a weapon, uh, the artist takes the quivers with the arrows and uses real hair here and here as the weapon, um, showing that the site of uh, repression can become the site of liberation, as is all well known, unveiling one's hair or uh, removing the hijab has been uh, an act of defiance against the Iranian regime that is uh, one of the main um, kind of symbols of, um, of um, the woman life freedom movement. And here the hair becomes the weapon uh, in the work of art as well. And in this one, true to self, um, the, um, the woman is a modern woman, although she wears the armor of a different, from a different age. She has the earbuds that show that she is listening to music. She is part of a uh, cultural production. Her eyes are closed. She is um, um, concentrating on her internal interior world. But in the mirror, you see her looking, staring out with a very, very fierce uh, and strong look. So we move from women who are just um, resisting to women who are fighting back. Um, and the final uh, work that I wanted to share with you is called Fractured Spaces. Um, and here within um, a Persian architectural uh, setting, Kosavi paints figures from diverse cultures and epochs. Um, the central figure is based on a well-known Greek uh, grave monument from the Metropolitan Museum in New York. The relief is of a grandmother actually who holds a baby in her lap. And uh, there's a caption that says, um, when we were alive, uh, we used to uh, look at the sun um, and it links uh, life and death uh, and uh, um, through a matrilineal lineage. Kosovi places a missile between the woman's legs, uh, um, putting uh, something that's like a weapon in death instead of this uh, serene thinking of life. But she also paints a beautiful uh, pomegranate tree 
uh, amid the fragments of the stele, uh, again, uh, thinking about the paradox of life and death, uh, the paradox of using Persian setting, Persian women here, Persian angels up here, and then a totally modern young woman, again, her alter ego, who is repeated, uh, upon looking at a door, maybe she can go in, maybe she cannot. Um, this uh, shows that um, some of the uh, works by Kosovi, the contradiction that is so central remains. It doesn't create a cohesive work of art. Rather, she likes to show the in-betweenness of her experiences. So uh, to sum up, as, as you have seen, even through these photographs, Kosavi's artworks delight the senses, yet closer examination reveals that their visual appeal is a deliberate form of subterfuge, like the Persian miniatures that inspired them. Kosavi's works depict disturbing images of brutal domination and violence, repression, but these are camouflaged by seductive prismatic colors, such a gorgeous palette, harmonious arrangements of layered shapes, ornaments. So seducing us to look at them, she tells us stories of great pain and struggle. The other thing that we see is that we immediately think of the Persian in, uh, influence and we think, okay, she's an Iranian artist and she's influenced by Persian miniatures, but oh, there, um, she includes visual antecedents from other uh, cultures and movements, Greek, Roman, Hellenistic, Renaissance, Baroque, modern and contemporary visual sources uh, are uh, all kind of hybridized in her compositions, sometimes introducing jarring juxtapositions while broadening the reach and complexity of her feminist iconography. So a lot of the uh, students and visitors who come to see the show don't only think of the plight of women in Iran, although this of course was a trigger for the artist, they also think of women in other locations, including the United States, including today. And again, I wanna emphasize what the artist says, and I quote, one word that sums up my work is contradiction. Now, young women feature prominently in Kosavi's art. These female protagonists are, as we said, her alter egos. Uh, she says they reflect me and women like me, thinking about the Middle Eastern woman other. Um, the figures often appear fragmented, shackled, blinded, or silenced. At times, they're visualized in multiple iterations, variously sized and scaled, as if it's a story, a narrative, um, that you can follow the woman's journey. Sometimes they confront blocked doorways, overpowering obstacles or diverse emblems of an oppressive, oppressive patriarchal order, like the head of the Greek king that we saw here, or uh, Persian soldiers that we saw throughout, the ball and chain, uh, other emblems. Yet all the women, even though, though they're not uh, joyous, they convey a stoic determination and a resilience that later morphs into active self-liberation. And throughout, from the beginning, they hang on to keys and books, they commune with birds and trees, and they harness the forces embedded within their own imagination. 
Now, the artist's life experiences uh, as a young woman living in Iran, a divided life, you may recall, as an Iranian immigrant in the United States, coming uh, right when the so-called Muslim ban was enforced, uh, not an easy time. Most recently, as an Iranian exile, inspired by the woman life freedom protests. All of these experiences shape this art from reflections on misogynistic repression to creative articulation of self-empowerment. Argaman Kosavi, Black Rain follows the arc of a prolific and brilliant artist in her persistent quest for freedom. And I want to end with a quote by the artist herself. Um, and quotes by her are um, written throughout the exhibition. Um, she says, I'm not interested in perpetuating notions of cultural exoticism and portrayals of Iranian women as victims. My work is a vehicle for shifting power validating personal storytelling and connecting to universal messages about human rights. Thank you. So I see some questions and um, the first one is uh, by an anonymous attendee, are the women's faces self-portraits? Um, so they are and they aren't. They're symbolic self-portraits for sure. They're alter egos for sure. You can tell that it's the same kind of woman. And Argavan talks about wanting uh, to find the skin color, the tone that's similar to hers, finding the, you know, the brown hair, the eyes. Um, she says, it's me and women like me. Um, and it's, um, you know, it's, it's, it's her experience, but it's also a collective experience. And if any of you have seen the coverage from Iran recently, you see a lot of the women with such long hair and the, um, the, the, the kind of um, presence that are very much um, the, the way that you see it there. There's another question. Uh, where did Kosavi source the hair used in the pieces? Um, she bought it. Uh, it's the hair that you buy for wigs, but I think she got it from areas where the hair is like mine, like hers. It's, it's the same uh, texture and type of hair that many of us have in the Middle East. Um, and she bought it. She also, uh acquired uh the leather that she used for the uh armor the chain mail um the the she 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 acquired all the elements that uh she added to the pieces but i have to say one of the most remarkable things is that she also made many of the things so um i'm wondering if i can go to uh one of these slides she she makes it this out of wood and then she saw this out of wood and then she um uh painted she put a canvas on top of this and painted this and painted all four sides this is a uh, very large uh for um um uh, freestanding sculpture um this by the way is called daughters and mothers and was directly influenced by uh, one of the um, sad uh, things that she saw from Iran, uh, where women, young women were killed and 
uh, that made their older middle-aged uh, mothers um, sit on the gravesite, cry for them, and then become activists. So um, you see this um, incredible kind of river of tears. And, um, but she sees both the daughters and the mothers as warriors who are fighting oppression and fighting for their freedom. Um, there's another, Ellen Cleary, thank you so much for making it possible for those of us who aren't there to see this exhibition in person. I so appreciate it. I would like to uh, emphasize that you really, um, you know, I'm trying my best with these photographs and, uh, but going into the exhibition and here a shout out to the graphic designer uh, and my thought partner, Sienna Scarf, who um, uh, the way the exhibition was conceived uh, and the way I curated it, uh, intended for you to come in and it's as if you're inside one of her pieces and you feel immersed, surrounded by these women who sometimes are crying, sometimes their head is a, a square, sometimes it's overpowered, but all the women are together and uh, this is part of what uh, she was trying to do. Um, and she has no assistance. Everything is in her uh, own thing. Ooh, I see more things. Um, Allison, Allison is one of our uh, interns. What elements of Koslavi's early work at RISD Brandeis do you think she carries into her later sculptural works? So I think the early works already begin to be sculptural. And I think that she uh, really, uh, I wonder if I can go back to the early works. You get to see everything again. So I can answer. So this is the earliest work. Uh, and you see that the Persian elements, uh, the decorative elements, the architectural uh, dimension, and this is actually cut, so it already you see her uh, aspiring to do three-dimensional work. And this work here, you know, painting on, again, the book, the passport, but a book-like form, and also uh, merging something that's Iranian with things that are not, uh, this kind of uh, element uh, we see here. I see another question. Has she spoken at all about how in displaying her art in a 3D format, there is a very interesting motif of the weight, density, and mass of freedom and liberation for the woman, how it is seemingly heavy and takes up space. That's, uh, Linnea, that's an incredible uh, insight, and you're absolutely right that uh, the heaviness of the pieces, the, the sheer weight of the pieces is part of what gives it its strength. And I think that um, the other thing that gives it the strength and the weight and the power of the women is that they become uh, larger than life. So from this, which is sort of life size, you have these pieces that are not just heavy. And trust me, I know they're heavy because we had to move them and we needed four art handlers to move one piece. But they're also um, overpowering. So from being overpowered, the women become monumental, strong, and overpowering. Yet the struggle persists. By no means is the struggle over. You see it uh, continuing even in the later works. Um, I see that there's one more question and I think that we are running out of time. Oh, okay. 
Thank you, Allison. Thank you, all of you who asked questions. Um, I am delighted that you found this of interest. Again, I tried and tried to make the work come to life, but you have to come and see it in person. This is huge. This is large. We we sh you know we do have some images with people in them that you can uh, see the the scale. Um, so I'm going to say uh, thank you very very much for choosing to join us, and I'm going to hand it over to uh, Maddie. I just want to echo Ganit and say thank you so much um, for joining us this evening. And we hope that you'll be able to join us for some of our other upcoming programs. Next week, um, we have Parallel Lives, Women of the Iranian Diaspora. That's next Wednesday with um, Argavan Khosravi um, in conversation with um, acclaimed author Marjan Kamali and Professor of Anthropology Shala Harry. We also have next Friday an artist talk with Lucy Raskin. That's an in-person artist talk making time a creative writing workshop on Sunday, October 1st. And then finally, um, Argavan Khosravi will give an artist talk on Saturday, October 14th. So we hope you can join us for those programs as well. So thank you everyone. And I hope you have a wonderful evening. <laughs>